Hello, my name is Rebecca Sadoon, and I'm a resident in the Departments of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at Duke University. This is going to be a Learning in 10 on Infectious Mononucleosis. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to recognize the symptom pattern of infectious mono, also known as mono, or IM for short, provide a differential diagnosis for mono, interpret test results ordered for mono, and counsel a patient who's been diagnosed with mono regarding infectivity, reactivation, activity precautions, and typical convalescence. By way of a quick outline, we'll start with a classic case presentation. We'll discuss symptoms, signs, and differential diagnosis. We'll talk about transmission and infectivity. And we'll also talk about the interactions of the virus with the immune system of the host. We'll discuss the diagnosis of mono, clinical course, what the patient should expect, and how to counsel the patient. And we'll end with a summary of take-home points. To begin with the first case, a 15-year-old girl comes to see you. A week ago, she developed a sore throat and a fever, and three days ago, she saw another physician who diagnosed her with strep throat and prescribed her amoxicillin. She says shortly after starting on that medication, she developed a rash all over her body, depicted here. She still feels sick, she's scared about the new rash, and she asks you what's happening to her. This is the list of common signs and symptoms of mono. You'll notice if you look at the symptom list, none of these are very specific. Malaise, fatigue, sweats, sore throat, things that you can find in the flu or the common cold. But the constellation of these put together and their severity would make you suspicious for mono. If suspicious for mono, you want to look for the following signs. Lymphadenopathy, swollen lymph nodes, particularly in and around the neck and the throat. Fever and pharyngitis, so a redness in the back of the throat, as well as splenomegaly. Adenopathy has a 100% sensitivity, and so if you don't have adenopathy, it's highly unlikely to have mono. Splenomegaly, on the other hand, uh, is only present 50% of the time, so the absence of splenomegaly does not reduce your suspicion for mono. However, if you do find splenomegaly, it's much more likely to be mono, as the common cold or the flu would not give you splenomegaly. Most of all cases of mono are caused by Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV. It's thought that CMV can probably cause mono as well, but the tests right now are for EBV, so it's difficult to diagnose somebody with CMV mono. EBV is present in a large percent of the population, and so people are often exposed as early as childhood. When patients are exposed in their childhood, they rarely develop symptoms. Most adults have long since been exposed, and so they don't contract EBV or develop symptoms of mono frequently. And it's therefore the majority of cases of mono that occur between the ages of 15 and 24. When a patient is exposed earlier, they don't have symptoms and they don't come to your clinic for the symptoms. And it's very unlikely that somebody would escape past the age of 24 without having been exposed. EBV is shed in saliva and therefore most commonly spread through kissing or sharing of food. And it's important to know that a patient is contagious even weeks before symptoms ever begin and can remain contagious for months after the symptoms come to an end. Finally, transmission can occur via breast milk and sexual intercourse as well. EBV, also known as human herpes virus 4, persists as an episome inside B cells, so it's a collection of DNA inside the B cells. Cytotoxic T cells can recognize the infected B cell and activate in an attempt to destroy them. However, rarely are they able to do so, and so the infection remains latent inside the B cell. And the presence of this DNA inside B cells um, makes the patient susceptible to diseases down the road, including lymphoma of the Hodgkin's or Burkitt's type, other malignancies of T or NK cells when they become infected, as well as autoimmune diseases and chronic fatigue syndrome, all of which have been associated with EBV infections. For the diagnosis of infectious mono, you'll want to order a complete blood count with differential. You're looking for a lymphocytosis, so at least 50% of the white blood cells should be lymphocytes, and probably more than 4,500 of them would be expected to be present. You'll also expect to see a large percentage of atypical lymphocytes. Seeing 5 or 6 is not uncommon on a normal differential, but greater than 10% would raise your suspicion for mono. 
And this is a picture of an atypical lymphocyte. Again, that's the activated cytotoxic T cell. You'll also order a hepatic function panel to look for transaminitis or elevated AST or ALT. And you'll likely order a monospot, also known as the heterophile agglutination test. And this is a test that can provide a rapid answer as to whether or not a patient has mono. The test is highly specific, so if it comes back positive, the patient does indeed have a diagnosis of mono. But it's not extremely sensitive. It picks up only about 75% of cases, leaving 25% of patients with a negative diagnosis where you to stop here. So while all patients get a CBCD, a transaminitis test, and uh, a monospot, if the monospot is negative and you have a high suspicion for mono, you would still want to order the EBV-specific antibody panel. This is what's going to pick up that remaining 25% of patients. The EBV antibody panel tests for a minimum of four antibodies, and this can help you differentiate between three potential states. One is the patient has never been exposed to EBV. The other is that the patient has an acute infection of EBV. And the third is that a patient has a chronic or latent infection of EBV. And all patients fall into one of these three categories. It's uh, tricky if you test within the very first week of symptoms because it's possible the patient is infected but not yet developed any antibodies. But if you start testing between weeks one and two, if the patient has an acute infection, you'd expect to see VCA IgM and VCA IgG already present. And this is a sign of a acute current infection. With time, in months two to three, the patient begins to develop EBNA, and this is going to remain present throughout life along with the VCA IgG. There's a mnemonic that the NA in EBNA stands for never acute. So if this is present, you know the patient has a chronic infection because it takes two to three months before you'll ever start to see this antibody. In a chronic infection, you'd expect to see EBNA and VCA IgG, but not VCA IgM. So that helps you differentiate between chronic versus acute. Another way of looking at it is this particular graph, which demonstrates that for the first seven days, there might not be any antibodies present. Then you quickly start to develop your VCA IgM and your VCA IgG. The IgM is going to disappear. The IgG is going to persist and the EBNA is going to develop somewhere around week 10 and be present for life. We can return now to our case of the 15-year-old who came to you with the symptoms of sore throat and fever, as well as a rash that she developed when she was treated with amoxicillin. The story is pretty typical for mono. The sore throat and the fever are some of the earliest symptoms that you'll see. They can easily be confused with strep throat, and so they belong on the differential diagnosis together. Whereas for strep throat, the symptoms begin to improve after the initiation of amoxicillin. Very frequently, patients with mono develop a terrible rash when exposed to any antibiotic in the penicillin family. If you were to see this patient in clinic, you'd therefore want to order a complete blood count with differential, hepatic function panel looking for transaminitis, as well as a monospot test. And this patient has such a classic story that if that monospot test were negative, you'd still want to proceed with getting the EBV antibody tests because you have a high clinical suspicion for mono in this case. So what do you tell this girl when you tell her she has mono? What should she expect? You can tell her that the fever, the pharyngitis, and the lymphadenopathy are likely to last one to three weeks. However, the fatigue can last for months afterwards. Chronic mono, which only happens between 5 and 10% of the time, is defined as symptoms that last in excess of 6 months. And then rarely there is a reactivation which can occur. Primarily these are immunosuppressed patients and not something that this particular individual should be worrying about now. She should know that care is largely supportive. You can't kill this virus, but we can try to make you feel better, reducing your fevers, reducing the aches and pains with Tylenol or Advil. And while antivirals don't lessen uh, the duration or the severity of the disease, if the pharyngitis, the sore throat, is extremely severe, we can give steroids to help with that. And finally, the patient should know that she should not engage in any contact sports for the first three to four weeks out of concern for splenic rupture. The splenomegaly that often occurs with mono makes you susceptible to rupture of the spleen and significant hemorrhaging. And as a result, before a patient returns to contact sports, they should be reevaluated by a physician who should ensure that they no longer have any splenomegaly. 
a couple of key take-home points. The first is that nearly all adults have been exposed to EBV. And the symptoms of mono, therefore, most likely occur when a patient is exposed during their late teen or early adult years. The period during which the patient is contagious can precede the symptoms by months and can follow the resolution of symptoms by months, and it's important that a patient know that they're still contagious. EBV remains latent inside B cells, and so antibodies VCA IgG and EBNA IgG will always test positive. Exposure to any penicillin during infection frequently produces a severe rash. And the diagnosis of mono is based on common labs, including a complete blood count, hepatic function panel, and then specific EBV tests, including the heterophile monospot test and the EBV antibody test.